Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Cameron. In fact, Morgan is head of the YAF chapter. I want to give you a copy of my book, New Deal or Raw Deal. And one of the greatest things that happened to that book was in 2009 when Thomas Sowell, the economist, said it was his book of the year. So I give you that, and thank you for heading the YAF chapter. I was involved with the YAF when I was a student, and it's very good because so many campuses you don't get uh, conservative or libertarian viewpoints. You you get typically a statist view, and having Northwood's different, but uh, in in so many campuses it's uh, absolutely essential to have uh, young Americans for freedom on campus. And I'm glad we have a chapter here at Northwood, and I'm delighted to be here at Northwood to be talking about entrepreneurs, and it, it, I, I wanted to start today with thinking, thinking about our economy, thinking about entrepreneurs, and you, you start, you have, you have President uh, Trump's great slogan, right? What's his slogan? <laughs> Make America great again. Well, you know, I'm a historian, and when you hear a slogan that gets repeated a lot, the obvious question make America great again, is, is when was America first great, right? See, I mean, I mean, look at it, and an economist would appreciate this too, it, because if you can locate when America was first great, and then you do why was America great, right? In other words, what happened that made America great, then obviously something happened that we lost at least some of that greatness, and then if we figure out how to restore that greatness, what we need to do is maybe imitate what we did in the first place that made America great. So that was a question, and the odd thing was so few people asked it, <laughs> right? And, and yet it seems like if we're going to get at the issue of wh how, to, how to restore greatness in America, that we ought to look, when was America first great? And you know, looking at this, my first impulse, and I've, I've asked people, you know, well, when was America first great? And some people say, well, I mean, George Washington, we were great, right? From the, from, I mean, we got the Constitution in place, and that had uh, many positive features that were unique among the nations. And then George Washington came in and launched us, and we were great. And there is some merit, I think, in looking at that. The Constitution is an essential feature with its limited government to achieving greatness. But I wish was, there, there was an, a lack of, I just wasn't comfortable with that for, for a couple of reasons, as being a good answer. When was America first great? You know, uh, number one, we had slavery. And I, I'm not sure you can say, boy, we were great and we had slavery. That, that just doesn't work. And the other thing is, you will appreciate, because I know so many people here are interested in economics at Northwood, is that we had a lot of state intervention. I don't know what else to say. Some by uh, the federal government and some by individual states. Remember, like the Erie Canal was a state-built canal. Uh, we had, in, in the book I wrote, Empire Builders, which is on Michigan entrepreneurs, we had a federally operated fur company that was a disaster. We, we had subsidies to steamships. We had subsidies that started the telegraph, and then it was quickly sold to private enterprise because the government ran it unprofitably for one year. And then eight years later, under private enterprise, it had 22,000 miles of wire. And it was all over the country. And so, you, you know, these government programs, and the railroads, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, all of that suggests, hey, that's not greatness. We have unfortunate government intervention, but we have slavery. And so you don't say, hey, we're great. Our, our government interventions weren't as disastrous as other countries. It doesn't sound right. It doesn't have a good ring to it. So you think, okay, slavery, what about after the Civil War, we're going to get rid of slavery? Aha, uh -huh, that's, that, 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 that's something. And you think Abraham Lincoln did it. And, and I want to give Lincoln credit. 
Because on the issue of natural rights, the equality of one person to another in the sense, equality in the sense of equality of opportunity and the importance of that and the individual worth of, of all humanity, that he really made some excellent, he had some good ideas and then defended them well and we did achieve the elimination of slavery. And so that's good, but Lincoln also had this interventionist economics too. The transcontinental railroads, right? Union Pacific and Central Pacific, both getting federal subsidies to go across the country. We're not gonna go across the country with private enterprise, we're gonna go east to west with federal subsidies. Here's what Abraham Lincoln said. And I guess I have a question or, or comment. What could go wrong with this approach? Here is what Lincoln said to the president of the Union Pacific Railroad. Because we're paid by the mile to go across the country, paid by the mile. And here's what he said. If the subsidies provided are not enough to build the Union Pacific, ask double and you shall have it. If the subsidies provided are not enough for the Union Pacific, ask double and you shall have it. What could go wrong? Can anybody help me? What, what, what might go wrong with that? See, then we gas double and then we, we get a doubly good railroad. Okay. Can we help? What's the problem? Yes, sir. <laughs> might be twice as long as it needs to be. Oh, that's perceptive. That's perceptive. That, in fact, that's worth thinking about. It may go where it doesn't need to go just to get subsidies. Yeah. You have hit the first feature of that. And I, when I wrote the book, The Myth of the Robber Barons, I had a chapter on the transcontinental railroads. And it's interesting to look at that. You say, okay, we're gonna pay people, we're gonna pay these companies by the mile to build a railroad. So you have the Union Pacific starting in Nebraska and going west to California. And then in California, you have the, the Union or the Central Pacific and it's gonna be going in the other direction. So they both, see, see that, that, that's gonna get it built quickly because they're both going for the subsidies and they're both gonna be going and then they'll meet and then we'll have a big railroad. Well, the Union Pacific started and they're going across Nebraska, which is where I'm from and it's flat out in Nebraska. And they, it was easy to build the railroad and so they were building it, making all this money and the road took the shape of this. Yeah, like maybe they're building it twice as long. And cause, I mean, the subsidies were coming in. You, they were gonna run out of Nebraska after a while. But if they could go like this, they could just keep making money with the taxpayer. Just kept spending that. And then when they finally got the, the two railroads, I, I, in fact, I was at, uh, I gave a, a speech one time when I was, because uh, I taught at Hillsdale College for so long. And I had one guy who was at the speech just got up and said, I spent my whole life working for the Union Pacific Railroad. I thought, well, this will be interesting. And he said, and we're still trying to straighten that road out. You know, even after many years, it is still crooked. And so the Union Pacific was poorly built uh, as it goes across the, the country. And once we begin to get close to the Central Pacific. See, now they're competing for the same land to build on to get subsidies. We had the invention of dynamite to get through mountains because you get a flat grade if you go on dynamite through a mountain. The Union Pacific could have written a book called Dynamite, its uses and abuses. And some of the abuses are going up to the Central Pacific and blowing up their track 
and then saying, they don't get the mileage credit because they don't have any track there anymore. But we're going to build over there, and we get the money. Now, this is going to be a tough one for Northwood students. I wonder what the Central Pacific did. In all my years of teaching, I never had a student miss this question. What do you think the Central Pacific did about getting their railroad blown up? A, they turned the other cheek. B, they gritted their teeth and said, we can do it anyway. Or C, they blew up the Union Pacific's track with their dynamite. How many A's? B's? Oh, we did have an A? No? C? Very good. You all, Dr. Matchik, good students. They're off to a great start. Yes, the answer is C. That's exactly what it is. They blew up the Union Pacific track. So now the railroad is not making any progress because both sides are blowing up each other's track. And so Congress has to get involved and said, nobody gets any money for any subsidy for any railroad built if you're blowing up. No more dynamite or else nobody gets any more subsidies. So I had to quit the dynamite and now the two railroads are going to have to come together. So here they come. They're coming together. They're going to meet. And they parallel each other. Both claiming mileage for track. They refuse to meet. So the Congress has to get involved again and said, you will meet at Promontory Point, Utah. You will meet. You will meet there. Nobody gets a subsidy for any mileage beyond Promontory Point, Utah. And so, well, okay. They do that. And then they pound in a golden spike, which is almost stolen, but it was recovered. And we have the completion of a Union Pacific. It was so poorly built that we had to rebuild the road somewhat before it could be completely operable. And that is the story of our first transcontinental railroad. We paid more for that railroad than the, the U.S. national debt in 1860. It was a huge federal expenditure. And after that disaster, a lot of congressmen, a lot of people said, well, okay, Lincoln got the slavery thing right, but he didn't get the railroad thing right. We didn't get the subsidy thing right. We were trying to catch up with England. Part of the reason for these subsidies was England was the major world power, and if we could just stretch across the country and get our products out there, we would be better than England. And a lot of them said, look, England is ahead of us. They may stay ahead of us. But they said, we may catch England, we may never catch England, but we're going to do it through private enterprise. We're going to do it, and we're going to trust our entrepreneurs. We're going to try something completely new. We're going to abandon the subsidies for the new industries, and we're going to see what happens. And a lot of people, you know, you think, well, yeah, they said it, but are they going to do it? And they were nervous. Congress was nervous themselves because they said, what if some, a new Congress group comes in and some politician promises them a subsidy? And then they'll, oh, yeah, good idea, and they'll vote one in. And they thought, here's something we can do to show we're serious. We can, e you'll like this one, we can eliminate the income tax. Right? You eliminate the income tax. That reduces Congress's power to raise money to give a subsidy to someone. The Transcontinental was finished in 1869, and, then, and, and in 1872, th by three years later, we had ended the income tax, which was started during the Civil War. So, some of you may have thought it started with the 16th Amendment, 1913, but it actually started in the Civil War, and it was progressive, a progressive tax on income, and it was eliminated completely under President Grant, 1872. And they said, furthermore, we're going to try to get balanced budgets and budget surpluses every year because we have debt 
from the Civil War. We have debt from the transcontinental railroads. We're going to pay that debt off as much as we can and then turn our entrepreneurs loose. I want to tell you something because there's a tendency to criticize politicians, which is usually very well supported. But this group in the post-Civil War period, those four decades after the Civil War, sometimes called the Gilded Age in American history, late 1800s, those politicians had 28 straight years of budget surpluses. We had balanced budgets, I mean surpluses, where the revenue is, and that's without an income tax. Revenue, it's, it's from selling land and, and for tariffs. Uh, we had revenue here, expenditures here every year for 28 straight years. It was the spirit of the age. The, this, we had failed so much doing other things. We're going to try this no matter what. Our national debt was cut in two-thirds. We had a $3 billion national debt in, 19, or in 1865. And by the end of the century, it was down to $1, one billion. We went from $3 billion to $1 billion national debt during these years of the late 1800s it, and eliminated the income tax. So we put ourselves in a position where if our entrepreneurs don't get the job done, the United States is not going to have economic growth. But, the, but, but Congress and many others who were behind us said, but, but I think that freedom will work. I think that, the, that, that entrepreneurs will respond. They're not being taxed. They're not being regulated. They're going to get out there and invent things. And it's always tough because you say, what? Right? And you can't very well, you don't know what. Well, it starts out with the transcontinentals. We're going to get a privately built transcontinental to compete with the Union Pacific and Central Pacific because it's so bad that people don't like to travel on it. It's broken down. You don't like to, when you're going over through Nebraska, go through like this all the way out to California. It's terribly inefficient. And so an immigrant named James J. Hill from St. Paul, Minnesota, built a transcontinental across the northern part of the United States called the Great Northern Railroad. The Great Northern Railroad without one cent of federal funding. None. And what he'd do is he'd build out to Montana and then he'd, he'd try to develop the copper industry there in Montana. He would develop farming in the Dakotas. He got out to Washington and he developed the timber industry. And so he was out there developing industries out west. And the upshot was he had such a successful railroad that when the hard times hit in the 1890s, we had the Panic of 1893, the Union Pacific and Central Pacific went broke. And James J. Hill was profitable. He had the best built railroad in the country. Also, he said, and by the way, when I'm building my railroad, I don't build it across the Dakotas like this. I build it straight across a tremendously efficient railroad. That starts it going. And then you get other people coming in. Now we have a private transcontinental that's outperforming all the others. The lesson is not lost on people. We have, listen, to these inventions during the 1870s and 80s and 90s, we have the typewriter by Christopher Scholes, a, a, a businessman from Pennsylvania. He, he invents uh, the typewriter. He, in, he develops the QWERTY system. QWERTY is sometimes called, but we still use the keyboard. Typewriter. We have the invention of the telephone. The telephone. Right. And the Alexander Graham Bell, of course, inventing that. And you, uh, the, uh, Al uh, Rutherford Hayes, the first president to use the telephone. And, uh, you know, there's a picture of Hayes, and the first one with a smile on his face. I, maybe he's smiling because it was not a telemarketer calling him, I don't know. 
telephone is invented. You have, uh, oh, electricity with Thomas Edison. Electricity invented. And he's got the phonograph, you know, record music and all of this. The movies, movies, film, movies, Thomas Edison, all of this being invented. Now, I say that's kind of interesting because when people made the decision in 1870 or so, we're going to eliminate the income tax, we're not going to try the subsidy stuff anymore, and we're going the freedom route, and somebody says, well, what, how do you know that will be better? The, maybe the government will be helpful. How do you know what they're going to invent? You know, they can't say, oh, well, we're going to invent electricity. See, well, huh? You know, we're going to go out there and invent the typewriter. People didn't even really know that that might even be something that they might want. Now, this was brought home by the greatest inventor of them all, the era, probably, uh, Henry Ford, right? I had to get him in at Northwood, you know, the cars and all of that. Yeah, I like this because, you, you, you know, you look, by the way, of course, our iPhones combine something of the typewriter and, and the music, you know, and all of that, too. We've got, it's funny how these inventions really connect in this invention. But it, 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 Steve Jobs was a student, in effect, of Henry Ford. Henry Ford said, I'm going to try to give them something they want before they know they want it. I've had this for years, but I didn't know I wanted it. And now it's so indispensable. I mean, it's like, do I have my wallet? Do I have my iPhone? Yeah, got that. Okay, I can go. Oh, yeah, I have clothes, too. I mean, the point is, you've got to have... It's such an indispensable part of what we haul around now. But I didn't even know I wanted it. In fact, when it came out, I didn't know I wanted it. In fact, I said I didn't want it. And finally, my son said, Dad, you want it. <laughs> and when he showed me all it could do, I said, I want it. <laughs> and I've got it. And uh, the, Ford was the same. When, when Ford was asked, I want to improve transportation, what do you want? And people said, faster horses and better carriages that can avoid potholes. That's what they want, faster horses and better carriages. Henry Ford does not deliver faster horses or better carriages. He's got an automobile. And, I mean, it's it, like so many inventions, it starts really, really primitive. Uh, I mean, like the, like the telephone for, you know, they, they didn't even have... The, the first phone, you didn't even have a signal, but you indicated that there was a call. You had to agree to be at the line at a certain time, and then somebody else would be there, and then you'd start talking. Well, that's not exactly a really big market for that sort of thing. You have to keep making steady improvements. And that's exactly what we did with the automobile. Ford started, as many of you know, in a, in a rented garage that he had outside his, his house. And he had a rented garage, and he was tinkering with this, this what he called a quadricycle. <laughs> he had bicycle tires, four of them, and he finally got this contraption running, and then he couldn't get it through the door. So he took an axe and started whacking the door open so he could get the quadricycle through the door. This is in 1896. And so he, he had one of these busy neighbors, you know, a busy body that was out there looking out there always, a strange man who is doing something in that shed out there. And oh, and look at him with this axe. And he called up the landlord. He's doing it now. He's gone crazy. You need to get over here. The landlord came running over. And when he saw what Ford had there in the garage, he helped him with the axe. I mean, it was like, let's get this thing out of here and see. And he's the guy who held the lantern while Ford drove through the streets of Detroit with his quadricycle. Not much of a market for it in 1896, but with steady improvements, huge market, huge market. Ford becomes, after John D. Rockefeller, the second billionaire in U.S. history. And he anticipated Steve Jobs and others so innovative, giving people something they couldn't imagine. We turned our entrepreneurs loose and they vaulted the United States into an incredibly superior position. Uh, I would be remiss if I left out the airplane. 
right? That's pretty big, too. All of this part of this same generation. I think these people have, this post-Civil War generation maybe has a, a claim to being the greatest generation. The airplane is interesting because the airplane produced sentiment, and, and this will be my final example, but the, the airplane produced sentiments that people said we needed government again. You know, you, you sort of, you know, I'm cleaning out my ears a little, you, you hear that, what? After all this success without it, yes. Yeah. And think of the logic behind it. The airplane was something that, un unlike the automobile, it was much more imagined. The idea of a flight. I mean, you, some of you know Da Vinci, even they, back in the Renaissance, had pictures of fly. The idea that, of a human being being able to fly was something that was in the imagination of some people. And so as we became more technologically capable, with all these inventions, many of them here in America, as we surpassed England, Europe said, we're going to have to experiment because whoever invents the airplane is in position to rule the world. The country that invents the airplane may be able to rule the world. Okay. England, Germany, and France in particular, all did extensive research on the airplane and subsidized people in their country to experiment with an airplane. Here is what many people in the United States were saying including getting into politics, politicians. They said this. England, Germany, or France are funding experts to build the airplane. While we sit around here, and we have great inventions, we have a typewriter, we're good. We, we have a telephone. We can call and tell everybody, hey, the Germans invented the airplane and they're on their way to bomb us. While well, we're busy supporting free markets and just letting entrepreneurs run willy-nilly around the country, they're focusing it on something that can make a difference in the history of the world. I, and they said, I don't doubt that some American, as good as we've been in the last generation, it could probably maybe invent the airplane. But it may be too late. Because by then the Germans or the French or the English may have that airplane and they're going to be, that'll be nice as they're driving over Manhattan, flying over Manhattan with the airplane, dropping bombs. If we're saying, well, we're tinkering and we're inventing Coca-Cola, which was another invention, by the way, at the time, while they're inventing an airplane and then they dominate the world militarily. That is exactly what we were facing. And they said, this is one time we need to stop this free enterprise stuff and fund the best person or people we can find. Get that airplane and beat them. It's a essential for national defense. The subsidy people had gained an argument and so what I'm telling you is after a generation of very limited government, except for a tariff here and there, we're not subsidizing it. Any of those industries that I've mentioned do not get federal subsidies. We have a dramatic call. Yes, we will have a government subsidy to invent the airplane. And so then we think, do we have somebody who's in position to do the inventing? We did a man by the name of Samuel Langley. Samuel Langley, head of the Smithsonian Institution in the United States, considered by many to be most America's most prominent scientist. He had inventions, but the important thing are not just his inventions, but his development in aerodynamics. 
He had written what was considered the textbook in aerodynamics, a book called Experiments in Aerodynamics. And it was the Europeans were reading his book, among other things, in their own research to invent the airplane. Langley had taken a model airplane, I mean, a small one. He got an engine on it, and he's in, at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. He flew the plane over the Potomac River. This was such a phenomenal event. Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone, said, this guy is wonderful. We've got to go. Langley's the greatest inventor of the generation. He's the guy we need to go with. The question, of course, is can Langley, he did it with a, a miniature airplane, can he do it with a big one, with a passenger? And so that was the question, and Langley was invited to come. And I've got to say, Lan Langley traveled, he always had a, a retinue, you know, a group of people following him, uh, just always, you know, oh, Mr. Langley, what can we do for you? Just very obsequious, fawning over him, carrying his suitcase, uh, his briefcase, rather, carrying his pen and pad, all of these things, uh, so that Langley would come in and then get his e equipment and begin writing something. Langley came in and was, he had an honorary, he had honorary do doctorates, an honorary, honorary degree from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, and Yale. And he came in, and the committee just said, Mr. Langley, uh, we're thinking about, we want to give somebody a subsidy because we've got to beat these other countries inventing the airplane. And do you think you can build such an airplane that would, that would carry a person or people? We have a possible subsidy. And Langley said, I volunteer to receive the subsidy. Isn't that nice? I volunteer to receive the subsidy. Yes. He said, however, even I might not succeed the first time, so may I please have funding for two tries, just in the off chance that my first one doesn't work. And they said, yes, we will even allow for that remote possibility, and we agree to fund you. And Langley was to have funding to build the airplane. And it was interesting as he began doing this in 1900, he, this is all going on, and Langley, I think the thing that would surprise you, if you could see what Langley was doing, the thing that might surprise you the most is that his operation and his his, because we're thinking right of an airport and a runway and things, he had, the flight was going to take place on a houseboat on the Potomac River. That was the launch. Because he envisioned air flight as being like a catapult. You spring it into the air. And, and see, the idea is if your engine is good enough, It'll keep, the, it'll keep the plane going. He even used an, an example, Michigan, we appreciate. You know, an ice skater on thin ice can be kind of skating along and not fall in. But if you stop and the ice is thin enough, then that's when you fall. He says the same principle in flight. If you stop, that's a problem. But if you've got this engine that can keep you going, it'll at least go for a few minutes, and that'll keep, get, get us started here with flight. And so the key is the engine. He said the key was the engine and a catapult device. How many, how many do Angry Birds? <laughs> I'm gonna, do some of you do Angry Birds? Yeah, I do, I admit. I, yeah, I start, yeah. I, that wasn't why I said this was essential, by the way. I mean, I, although I did, I got kind of addicted to it for a while, but then I, I, I went cold turkey. But Samuel Langley invented it, and he goes down. And it, it's the concept here. You pull back, launch it into the air. And then the engine takes over and you fly. Uh, he needed a pilot. Naturally, he had to be Ivy Lee, right? And so he got a recent gradu graduate from Cornell University. 
that's Dr. Matchek's university. Dr. Matchek, where did Dr. Matchek go? <laughs> Do they talk at Cornell about the guy who flew this flight, Charles Manley? <laughs> Charles Manley was his name. Do they, when you were at Cornell, was he a great vision of glory? <laughs> okay. Well, there may be a reason for that, which we'll get into in a minute here. Uh, Cornell, yeah, we had, Manley was going to be the pilot, and he got in. The day that, that Langley was going to fly, he had, because he was always like to interview with reporters and all this, he had a 21-gun salute to let everybody in Washington know, here it is. And everybody, the reporters were out there. And so Langley got back, his pilot got in, and they pulled back the catapult. Boom! The engine's off, on, going. Right into the ground. Or not, I should say the, the, the Potomac, not the ground. It's into the water. Actually, it's fortunate, I guess, that he was on the water because he land on the water rather than the ground. Because the pilot, the Cornell guy, he, everybody was more like, you know, at first everybody was just, boom, that was a, that was a flop. And then it's, where'd the, where'd the pilot go? You know, and he, all of, they dug around and this guy, <gasps> they pulled him up. He survived it. And they, they, they pulled him out. And uh, because I've, I've written on this in, in a book I wrote called Uncle Sam Can't Count, I've got a chapter on, on this subject. And, you know, I was researching and I thought, well, who should I quote to explain this flight? And I thought the Washington Post right there is kind of the newspaper of record. So I went to the Washington Post. And what they said, let me look it up here. They had 13 words that they used to describe this first venture into space. And I want to quote them exactly for you. I don't want to miss a word. Here's what they said about the flight. Any stout boy of 15 could have skimmed an oyster shell much farther. <laughs> Any stout boy of 15 could have skimmed an oyster shell much farther. And they were making the point, there was no flight. I mean, it wasn't like this, and then, oh, for a while, and then collapse. They wanted to make that, listen, this was this, and then that, immediately, zero. Langley said, uh, not to worry, even Edison failed on first experiments occasionally. Number two, we're going to get the minor kinks worked out of this, and we're going to go right into space. The second flight came December 8th, 1903. This time, the catapult was there. By the way, the Cornell guy was back for the second one, too. <laughs> and he's back, and they get him in there, and they've got th th this airplane, and they lean back. This time they didn't have a 21-gun salute, by the way. But they've, they've, they've got him back. It was almost identical, as people say. That nobody could discern any difference except they could tell the second one because the wings came off. Uh, and again, they amazingly, the pilot, which the submerged, they sent people after him. He just about drowned, but he made it. He was alive and survived and apparently not honored at Cornell. Okay, but Dr. Matchick tells us there's no recognition of his, <coughs> I, I can't use the word achievement, but his daredevil tactic or whatever. Anyway. That was the second try. This time, the newspapers were not quite so generous. The Boston Herald said this, Mr. Langley needs to abandon airplanes and try his hand at submarines. The New York Times said, the reason Langley failed, 
He's the best we have. The reason he failed is that it is so complicated to fly that it's going to take mathematicians, engineers, and scientists of working hard on this about one million years before we will be able to accomplish flight. Their estimate was in error. It was in error by 999,999 years and 356 days. Nine days after the failure of Langley's second flight, the Wright brothers, two non-college educated bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, who had been experimenting with wind currents and watching birds fly, and they tried gliders. They went to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina because of the wind currents, and they would go off a hill and they would try gliders, you know, no engine or anything, but they, they, they watched birds and they wanted to get a feel for flight, and they did that for a couple summers. When you know, business was slow at the bike shop, so they went to Kitty Hawk for a while. Neither Orville nor Wilbur Wright had ever been to college, and they ended up nine days after Langley's failure, they said, now it's our turn. They came out, and that day they had four successful flights, December 17th at Kitty Hawk, one of which was almost a minute long, and they had they would take turns, they, they would have one person on the plane, and you, they, 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 they would gauge the wings by having their, their, their hands, their arms on the wings, and they had their feet controlling a rudder device too, and they made the point, they said, what we didn't like about Langley was, how you, I mean, how are you gonna, how are you gonna turn corners? How are you gonna stop it? You, you've gotta have some way to make it commercially possible they just didn't agree with the engine theory and the, the launch, the catapult theory. And so they liked the runway theory and were working with a one-man pilot on their small little plane. They wanted to make it commercially possible. They said, this is the era of the entrepreneurs. We want to be entrepreneurs too. We want to produce a product that adds value to humanity. And we have not discovered a great need for one-minute flights yet. Right? That would get me back right to the conference center where I'm staying tonight, you know, a one-minute flight. So that was not going to work. So they said, we've got to get hours. And so they spent the next three years increasing their efficiency, trying new styles, and they got to where they could do three, uh, almost two to three hours. And they thought, now we're prepared to use it not only commercially, but to sell to the government for national defense. They offered their right flyer to the U.S. government for $25,000, much less than the subsidies that were paid to Langley. And so they said, you can buy it, and it's, we know how to work it. We'll help you run it and all that for $25,000. But I've got to say this. The government was desperate to purchase something, but other offers came in. The French approached the U.S. government, and they said, we have something even better. Forget about these, quote, airplanes. They're newfangled, and they're high-tech, and they're not going to work. We have something else, a balloon. Hydrogen was, we think of a helium balloon today. This was hydrogen balloon. You get up in the air, and then you've got bombs, and you go over on the balloon, and then you drop them, and then you go back. That's the wave of the future. That's the tech of the future, balloons. So we had that offer. So we had the Wright brothers with their plane. The French came with balloons. By the way, the, 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 the Defense Department was determined to do something. So you had the Wright brothers, you had the French, and then you had Langley wanting another subsidy to finish his job. So you had Langley, a subsidy to give to Langley an idea so that he would be able to do 
The third time, he says, we'll, we got it worked, we'll get it worked out this time. So you have three choices. You can either buy the right flyer, the Wright Brothers plane, number one. Number two, you can buy the balloon from the French. Or three, you can do a subsidy for landing. And I have a question for you. Well, I want to know what you think. The government was determined to do something. They were going to make a decision. They were going to do one of those three. And my question for you is, which one do you think they did? I want to take a vote. How many think they bought the Wright Brothers plane for $25,000 and had a plane that could be in the air for a few, two or three hours? One? <coughs> two! Okay. What a cynical group of young people in this audience. Shame on you. Okay. How many think they bought the balloon? Okay. And a few more. Eleven. Okay. How many think they gave the money to Langley? Oh, my goodness. Overwhelming number. By a huge margin, the majority clearly thinks they gave the money to Langley. And in this case, the majority. is wrong. Shame on you. I love it. In fact, at the request, one, one congressman said about the money, you know, because they were debating him, one congressman said about Langley, the only thing Langley ever made fly was government money. <laughs> no, Langley was rejected completely. They bought the balloon. They bought the balloon. They bought the balloon and rejected the Wright brothers and bought the balloon. However, there were some people in the government who were suspicious because the French, after selling us the balloon, invited Wil uh, Wilbur Wright to come over and demonstrate his airplane. And when he flew and did figure eights in the air and all this stuff all over France, they wanted to buy it. And that made our Defense Department suspicious. And so they ended up saying, well, we will add to our arsenal of a balloon. We will add the Wright Brothers airplane. Maybe it also will have a place. And we did ultimately buy it. So I'm happy to report that we did. But nonetheless, you have the airplane. Look at those inventions. Typewriter. And look at the, look how some of these really converge with our phone. Because we, we have the telephone. We have the keypad with the typewriter. Right? We have music. And Edison's inventing that. And, of course, we have the car that we use to drive around Midland. And all, you know, the, the, tremendous amounts of inventions. I, I came via airplane to do this speech indispensable inventions for promoting economic growth and development, free market, entrepreneurs, individual liberty. The United States vaults into first place. And don't you think Henry Ford had a little bit of an advantage because we also had the best oil industry, the best steel industry, so we're making cars cheaply. Those developed during the late 1800s as well. The United States is the number one world power 50 years after the Civil War. We are it. Number one, no one close. Before that happened, during the Civil War, we were second rate behind the Europeans. We changed our tactics. We changed our tactics, and we see the rise of the United States to being a world power. History teaches us what makes it, when was America great, first great? After the Civil War. Why? Because we went heavily to individual liberty and limited government, which sounds like a good recipe for making America great again. Individual liberty, limited government, the tactic that worked the first time. Thank you.
Good. Well, I think we have.